everybody, Dr. Ryan here. Thanks for joining me. We're getting to the heart of it today. We're looking at approach to the cardiovascular examination part one. God bless you. So today we're going to talk about history taking from a cardiovascular standpoint, the approach to the clinical examination of cardiovascular system, findings in specific pathology we're going to be covering in part two. So watch this space. Okay guys, here's my handy history taking template. And my mnemonic here is perhaps salt makes good food so tantalizingly tasty, right? So P stands for presenting complaint, S is systemic inquiry when you go progressively through the different systems, central nervous system, cardiovascular, respiratory, renal, gastrointestinal, endocrine, hematological, infectious disease, rheumatological, skin and eyes, okay, in good order. And with some medical history in terms of what conditions a patient has, what medications they're taking, are they allergic to anything, gynecological history where we speak to parity and gravidity, so those are the SMG, F is for family history, S for social history, in terms of the alcohol and their drug use and the occupational history and their employment, always, okay, occupational. T is for third party information and T for travel history. Perhaps salt makes good food so tantalizingly tasty. So this is just an aid memoir to use whenever you're taking a history from a patient. So honing into the systemic inquiry, cardiovascular system, you want to elicit uh, a history of chest pain or heaviness. Remember diabetics may be having a myocardial infarct, may not necessarily have chest pain, so they have chest pain equivalent symptoms in the way of dyspnea, in the way of dysautonomic features, nausea, vomiting, etc. So dyspnea, you want to elicit uh, if there's any dyspnea and use the New York Heart Association scale to quantify this. Okay, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about orthopnea and paroxysm with the term dyspnea. Palpitations married to syncope, palpitations married to syncope if they have one inquire about the other, ankle swelling, intermittent claudication and fatigue with diminished effort tolerance, right? Uh, very important to tease out if the patient has any coronary artery disease risk factors, it's a whole truckload of them. So did the patient have a previous myocardial infarct or have coronary artery disease before, angina, stable, unstable, etc. Smoking, you want to quantify how many years a patient has been smoking for and calculate your pack year history, which is essentially the number of cigarettes smoked per day divided by 20 multiplied by the number of years the patient has been smoking for to give you your pack years. Does the patient have a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, family history of coronary artery disease, diabetes mellitus, obesity and physical inactivity, <gasps> male sex and advanced age, and the new kid on the block is raised homocysteine levels. Guys, this is the pathophysiology of PND. What happens when you lie recumbent is there's the redistribution of fluid because the effect of gravity is negated. So you're going to have increased venous distance of the heart, which causes a rise in the left atrial pressure, causes increased left heart filling pressures, and a fall in your partial pressure of oxygen during sleep. There's also the fluid being redistributed in the blood because you're no longer erect, you are now supine. There's also a reabsorption of fluid from the tissues into the plasma. Classically, the patients complain of dyspnea, cough, frothy sputum, um, diaphoresis, fast heart rate, difficulty breathing. So these are the functional scales. The Canadian Cardiovascular Society looking at chest pain, the New York Heart Association looking at dyspnea. They're essentially the same degrees, just that one speaks to chest pain and one speaks to dyspnea. So grade one refers to, uh, in the CCS, is chest pain that does not ordinarily affect the patient unless they are excessively straining themselves. Now normal physical activity we say is quantified by walking up a flat of stairs or about two blocks of a flat on the flat, right? So grade one means that you know, it doesn't really affect them. Two is the slight limitation of ordinary activity. Three, where there's marked limitation and four is at rest. And the same applies to NYHA, the New York Heart Association. But instead of speaking to chest pain, we're speaking to dyspnea on the same scale. Medical history is the history of ischemic heart disease in the way of prior myocardial infarct or coronary artery bypass graft, excuse me, and um, history of rheumatic fever in the way of chorea, sexually transmitted diseases, recent dental work, thyroid disease, prior medical examination, example for school entrance or insurance or military purposes, drugs, 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 and more drugs, right? We're talking about prescription drugs, we're talking about over-the-counter drugs, we're talking about herbal and recreational drugs, okay? Social history, we already spoke about smoking, does the patient use alcohol, you want to quantify this, what's the patient's occupation, family history of ischemia, cardiomyopathy, congenital heart diseases, mites about prolapse, Marfan syndrome, important. Okay, this is the crux of the talk, guys. Inspection of the cardiovascular system. 
does the patient appear to be in obvious respiratory distress? Are they dyspneic or orthopneic? You're thinking about left ventricular failure. Does the patient look cachectic? And remember, with severe heart failure, there's congestion of your bowel wall veins. So you don't have proper absorption of nutrients. Long term, this leads to wasting, which is what we call cardiac cachexia. In the face, does the patient have a male flush, which speaks to mitral stenosis? A marfano inhabitus, so you have a tall patient with a greater arm span than, than body width. Okay, you have arachnodactyly, you have a high arch palate, you have pictus excavatum, you have a whole host of muscles, lethal signs, you have a dislocation of the lens, etc. Corneal arcus and xanthelasmata are two very strong indications of hyperlipidemia, which contributes to atherosclerosis and ischemia. Agar Robertson pupil here, the mnemonic is ARPPRA, accommodation reflex present, pupillary reflex absent. Accommodation reflex present, pupillary reflex absent, which happens in tertiary syphilis, may indicate that that patient also has associated aortic regurgitation because of involvement and dilatation of our beloved aortic roots. Uh, watch out for the high arch palate of Marfan's. Pala may be responsible for high output failure. It also happens in infidemica diaris. Cyanosis may be found in tetralogy of fallow and azomonga syndrome, which are examples of cyanotic congenital heart disease. Edema we found in congestive heart failure, specifically right ventricular failure. In the hands, you want to look out for clubbing, cholinoikia, cyanosis, splinter hemorrhages, osseous nodes, genuine lesions, xanthomata, and tobacco staining. All right, here's some classic examples. Thank you, short cases in clinical medicine. Here we have clubbing, clubbing with cyanosis. Here we can see Osler's nodes from the fingers. Remember, Osler's nodes are palpable and are tender. Ouch! O for Osler, O for ouch! Right here we have Osler's nodes on the toes as well. Here are peripheral stigmata from pitipinicotitis. So Jamie lesions which are non-palpable, they are macular and they are painless. Versus Osler's, which we can see here, which is palpable and painful. Here are splinter hemorrhages, here is a rot spot. Here are stigmata of hyperlipidemia, our beloved xanthelasmata. Here we have tendons and thomas, and here we have corneal arcus. Okay, moving on to the pulse, guys, you need to palpate the pulse for rate, rhythm, volume, character, condition of the vessel wall. You want to check for radio, femoral, radio, radio inequality. Compare both your pulses simultaneously, with the exception of the carotids. Because imagine if you feel both the carotids and compression at the same time, your patient's going to pass out because of cerebral ischemia. Watch out! Volume and character are best assessed at the brachial and carotid arteries. The collapsing pulse in aortic regurgitation and pulse alternance in, in, in left ventricular failure are best appreciated at the radio. Guys, remember a normal pulse rate is 60 to 90 beats per minute. Anything above 100 beats per minute by definition is tachycardia. The different flavors of tachycardia, sinus tachycardia, is probably the most common due to a whole truckload of causes coming up. Watch the space. It could be supraventricular tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, and atrial flutter or ventricular tachycardia. Causes of sinus tachy. So sinus tachy essentially means that your heart rate is above 100 and if you do an ECG, you have a P wave followed by a QRS. So you can be sure that this heart rate electrically is originating from the sinus node. Physiologically speaking, lots of causes, anxiety, emotion, exercise, pregnancy. Pathologically speaking, any cause of a hyperdynamic circulation. So a fever, anemia, thyroid, toxicosis, AV, fistula, beri, beri, the list goes on. Congestive heart failure, myocarditis, chronic constrictive pericarditis, shock, 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 so shocking. <coughs> Acute anterior myocardial infarct, not the inferior flavor. The inferior flavor is going to knock off your sinus node, right? Because of involvement of your right coronary artery, all right? Sick sinus syndrome, hormonally embolus, and drugs like salbutamol, atropine, and any other sympathomimetics. Bradycardia basically means a slow heart rate below 60 beats per minute and a variety of causes. Sinus brady, which is in the next slide. Uh, second degree heart block, complete heart block, or it could be a nodal rhythm. Causes of sinus brady are physiological, and we have increased vagal tone, as we see among athletes, or of course during sleep when your natural vagal tone is reduced. Pathological causes of sinus brady is acute inferior MI, for the same reason we mentioned before, you're knocking out your RCA, which supplies the sinus node, which inevitably is going to give you bradycardia. Mixed edema because of reduction in sympathetic activity. Hypothermia, raised intracranial pressure, which gives you Cushing's triad, which is a triad of bradycardia, hypertension, and augmentation. And the reason you get this is because of the inhibitory effect on sympathetic outflow. Of Dr. John does say what? Causing bradycardia? Indeed. Because of deposition of bilirubin in the conduction system, slowing it down. Slow down. <laughs> Drugs like Tijoxin. Not beta locker, beta blocker, and we are drawn and Guys, let's talk about rhythm. 
pulse rhythm. Rhythm refers to the interval between successive pulses. So we certify them to regular and irregular. And of the irregular, there's regularly irregular and irregularly irregular. So regularly irregular means that there are two or three or more normal pulses followed by a drop beat. Examples the most common cause is sinus arrhythmia, which happens when the pulse increases on each expiration and decreases on each expiration. It's abolished by exercise by definition. Occasionally, ectopias can give you this as well as second degree heart block. Type 1, Winkelbach. Did you know? Did you know? that Winkelbach was a DJ because he dropped the beat. <laughs> Irregularly irregular speaks to the power to be irregular in rhythm and volume. Happens in the setting most commonly atrial fibrillation, also multiple ectopics, atrial flutter with variable block and paroxysmal atrial tachy with variable block. Now, how, pray tell, do you differentiate between atrial fibrillation and multiple ectopics at the bedside? Simply by physical exercise. If your patient is mobile and can do a couple of setups in the bed, do those setups, and with exercise, you will notice that those ectopics will disappear. But atrial fibrillation becomes more prominent. But of course, you're going to confirm this on ECG. Let's talk about volume of the pulse, everybody. Causes of a high volume pulse. Hyperdynamic circulation due to any cause, fever, anemia, thyrotoxicosis, very, very, the list goes on. Aortic regurgitation, patent ductus arteriosus, and hypertension. Causes of low volume pulse are shock, aortic stenosis, mitral stenosis, chronic constrictive pericarditis, pericardial diffusion, and pulmonary hypertension. Let's talk about pulse character. There's a few we want to talk about. Anachronic pulse, which give, in, uh, happens in aortic stenosis, which is slow rising, small volume, sometimes late peaking, which is what we call pulses parvus et tardis, slow rising, late peaking. Plateau pulse in AS as well, which is small uh, uh, volume and slow upstroke. Busfriens speaks to double peaking of the pulse, slow rise and collapsing, happens in mixed aortic valve disease. Waterhammer pulse, typically found in aortic regurgitation, also called the collapsing pulse. Pulses alternance with its alternating strong and weak beats, which happens in left ventricular failure. A jerky pulse best seen in the carotid speaks to hokum. Okay, collapsing pulse, guys, where you have a rapid upstroke and descent of the pulse seen by raising the arm above the head. So what you do is you palpate that, that radio pulse, you compress it until you can feel it no more, then you raise the arm above the head, and what you will feel is one high amplitude pulse waveform. That speaks to aortic regurgitation or can happen in hyperdynamic circulation from any cause. Pulses paradoxus is a favorite. So what happens is Physiologically, during inspiration, your intrathoracic volume increases and your pressure drops. Blood pools in the pulmonary vessels, so that left heart filling is reduced with a resultant reduction in cardiac output. Your pulse volume is low and it's reversed in expiration. But an exaggeration of this above 10 mils mercury speaks to pulses paradoxes and the causes of pericardial diffusion, especially tamponade, chronic constrictive pericarditis, acute severe asthma and COPD, or massive pulmonary embolus. Let's speak to the jugular venous pressure, guys. For this, the patient should be orientated. For 45 degrees. Right, and we note that the internal jugular lies medial to the sternocleidomastia. master. We look at the diagram just now. Don't ever use the external jugular vein because this is tortuous and subject to compression. So we'll talk about the height of it. Anything above three centimeters means that your right heart filling pressure is raised and speaks to right ventricular overload or right ventricular failure, sorry, or volume overload. If visible, you want to ascertain your ACV waves, check your hepatic jugular reflux, and measure the height from the sternal angle. So here are your different waveforms, guys. A speaks to atrial contraction. C speaks to the closure of the tricuspid valve. And V is peak pressure in the right atrium immediately prior to opening of the tricuspid valve. Right, your X descent is due to downward displacement of the tricuspid ring during systole, and your Y descent at the commencement of ventricular filling. So A, C, V waves, X and Y descents. All right, so here we can appreciate the internal jugular, which is lying just medium to the sternocleidal mastoid, right? And we want to check the top of the jugular venous pulsation in a vertical height from the sternal angle. Anything about three centimeters means it's up. It's going to be up in heart failure. Uh, and also when you have sustained abdominal, abdominal jugular reflux above 10 seconds, right? Pulmonary embolus is going to raise it, pericardial diffusion, pericardial constriction as well, but in pericardial diffusion you have a prominent Y descent, pericardial constriction you have a Cosmo sign, which is then increase in the JVP on inspiration. Normally when you inspire, the JVP comes down, but here when you inspire and the JVP goes up, watch out. Supertive vena cava obstruction, we have elevation with loss of the pulsation, right? So it's non pulsatile elevation of the JVP. Atrial fibrillation, we'd have absent A waves. Why? Because there's no coordinated atrial contraction, people. Alrighty. Tricuspid stenosis, you have giant A waves. Tricuspid recurrence, you have the giant C V fusion wave. Complete heart block cannon waves because of atrial ventricular dissociation and the poor atrium is trying to contract against this closed tricuspid valve. Shame. How do you tell the difference between a venous and arterial pulse in the neck? Well, 
the Venus pulse has two peaks per cycle, but actually it has just one. The Venus pulse has upper limit, not so with the artery, right? The Venus pulse has upper limit, which forced inspiration, not so with the carotid pulse. The JVP varies with posture, but the carotid is independent of posture. The Venus pulse is better seen than felt, but all of us know the arterial pulse, uh, pulse is better felt than seen. The pressure jugular reflux applies with Venus, but not with the arterial. The Venus pulse is lightly felt, but the arterial is thrusting. And if we apply light pressure at the base of the neck, the Venus pulse is relaxated, but not so with the arterial pulse. Other signs in the neck are the fusion CV waves we appreciate in tricuspid regurgitation. And often people, tricuspid regurgitation is functional, secondary to pulmonary hypertension with dilation of the tricuspid ring. So you're going to have other uh, stigmata of pulmonary hypertension, right? So the CV wave is a tall sinuous pulsation oscillating up to the earlobe. Uh, coarctation of the aorta gives you a vigorous arterial pulsation in the neck. Conjugate sign and aortic regular so-called dancing carotid pulse. Let's talk about blood pressure, blood pressure, blood pressure. You want to measure the blood pressure. If the pulse is absent in one arm or if there's radio radial or radio femoral delay, check blood pressure in both arms. Also check with the patient lying and standing. Otherwise, you're going to miss postural hypotension. In aortic stenosis, the situation is a low systolic, a high diastolic, and a narrow pulse pressure. But in aortic regurgitation, you have a high systolic, a low diastolic, and a wide pulse pressure. 95% of the time we know that hypertension is idiopathic, but 5% it can be secondary to some other cause. If you want to hunt for a clinical cause for secondary hypertension, and if you have evidence of widespread vascular disease and renal bruit, you want to think renal vascular disease, especially renal artery stenosis. Think fail when the patient describes paroxysms of sweating, headache, and palpitation. Hypertension with hypokalemia has a big differential, especially Crohn's syndrome. Cushing syndrome when the patient has Cushing right facies, central obesity, abdominal stria, livid abdominal stria, more than 2 centimeters, proximal muscle wasting, take a history of chronic exogenous glucocorticoid use, think coarctation of the aorta when there's low volume femoral pulses with radio femoral delay, if you can feel those big old kidneys, add up polycystic kidney disease, ADPKD. Okay, let's look at inspection at the precordium. You want to determine the shape of the chest in any deformity, for instance, kyphosis, scoliosis, pectus excavatum, or carinatum, any visible cardiac impulse, which is usually the apex speed, any other impulses, guys, epigastric, suprasternal, supracubicular, if there's a scar mark in the midline speaking to valve replacement or previous uh, coronary artery bypass, got cabbage, right? Not lettuce, but cabbage. <laughs> Pacemaker and cardio versus defibrillator box may be appreciated as a swelling in the chest. Some examples, guys, uh, courtesy of short cases. God bless you. So midline scars, a uh, scar that we can appreciate in the patient who had a coronary artery bypass graft before. Here's a scarf, mitral valvotomy. Now, in a female patient with those pendulous breasts, you may actually miss it because this is quite lateral. Watch out. Scar in the leg for cabbage for harvesting your vessels for the bypass. Pacemaker appreciated as a swelling on the anterior chest wall, okay? Apex speed, guys, is the lowermost and outermost definitely palpable cardiac impulse during systole. You want to localize the site, localize it to the particular inter interspace. If you can't feel it, always check for dextrocardia. Remember, normal position is one centimeter medial to the midclavicular line and the fifth left interspace. You, know, you want to note the distance from the midline and note the character. Is it normal? Is it tapping? Is it heaving? Is it thrusting? Is it diffuse? <laughs> Must be a throat. So what is the size of the throat? Is it apical, basal, or is it any other intercostal space? The nature, it's just systolic, diastolic, or both. So you want to time it with the carotid pulse. If it coincides with the carotid pulse, it's systolic. If not, it's diastolic, right? Apical throat is best assessed by turning the patient to the left lateral position with breath hold post expiration. Basal throat is best assessed with the palm of the patient sitting and bending forward and breath hold after expiration. So here we feel that beautiful apex. This is a correct technique. This is turning the patient to the left lateral position, feeling with your fingers. And here checking for a parasternal heave. What are the different characters of apex beats? So we have the heaving, thrusting, tapping, and a whole lot of others. So heaving speaks to pressure overload, which is forceful, sustained, and actually lifts the examiner's fingers, indicates left ventricular hypertrophy as in aortic stenosis and hypertension. Thrusting indicates volume overload, which is forceful, less sustained, and it also lifts the examiner's fingers, but not as much as the heaving one does. Indicates left ventricular dilation as opposed to hypertrophy, and happens in mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation. It's also called hyperkinetic or dyskinetic. The tapping apex is neither sustained nor forceful, and there's no lifting of the finger. This is a palpable first heart sound as in mitral stenosis. Double apical impasse is caused by ventricular aneurysm and hokum. Impalpable apex, not talking about the patient who is dead now, right? 
Other causes of implacable apex are thick chest wall as an obesity. When the apex is located just behind that rib, in emphysema, pericardial effusion, and dextrocardia, yep, the apex is on the right side, don't miss it. Causes of diffuse apex beat anterior MI, sometimes with RV aneurysm. Left parasternal here will left speech to right ventricular hypertrophy, usually in the setting of pulmonary hypertension. Causes of epigastric pulsation can be normally powerful, so a normal variant in a thin person. Could speak to right ventricular hypertrophy, aneurysm of the beloved abdominal aorta, a mass overlying the aorta, we really see a stomach and a positive and liver, as in tricuspid regurgitation. Causes of left ventricular hypertrophy, everybody, the common carpet, systemic hypertension, aortic stenosis, martial regurgitation, the ventricular septic defect, coarctation of the aorta, and hokum. Causes of right ventricular hypertrophy, pulmonary hypertension, co-pulmonary, pulmonary stenosis, regurgitation, and tricuspid regurgitation. A left panasternal heave or lift, so we saw the proper technique, right? You want to place the flat of your palm in the left parasternal area and fully feel that by giving gentle sustained pressure, and this speaks to right ventricular hypertrophy if indeed it is present. Palpable pulmonary component of the second heart sound speaks to pulmonary hypertension, epigastric pulsation speaks to right ventricular hypertrophy. Percussion is not routinely done, guys. It may be helpful to diagnose a pericardial effusion in which there's going to be an increase in the area of cardiac dullness and of course in the patient with COPD and emphysema that cardiac dullness is obliterated. Right, the money throwing moment, auscultation. You want to listen for your first and second heart sounds in all areas. You want to feel the carotid pass at the same time. The first heart sound corresponds with the carotid pass which is in systole and systole happens thereafter, sorry, and the second heart sound does not correspond with the carotid pulse. If you detect a murmur, you want to determine the site, is it mitral, tricuspid, aortic, or parasternal, the nature. So you want to feel the carotid pulse at the same time. Systolic coincides, diastolic does not. And if you detect the systolic murmur, try and ascertain whether it's pan-systolic or ejection systolic. If there's a diastolic murmur, is it early or mid-diastolic? Does the murmur radiate? For instance, a pan-systolic murmur going to the left axilla, ejection systolic going to the neck. Does it Defer with respiration because you know the right side of murmurs increase with respiration, something we call Carvalho sign, and left side of murmur increases with expiration. Then you know, grade the intensity of the murmur. By definition, guys, systolic murmurs are graded out of six and diastolic out of four. Here are the different sites for auscultation the mitral area, the tricuspid, the pulmonary, and aortic. Places where you want to listen, uh, necardic apex, listen for the first heart sound, third or fourth heart sounds, mid-diastolic murmur of mitral stenosis. In the lower left sternal border, here you want to detect the early diastolic murmurs of. Uh, aortic and tricuspid regurgitation, the opening snap of mitral stenosis, and the pansystolic murmur of the beloved VSD. Upper left sternal border, you want to hear for your second heart sound and pulmonary valve murmurs. Your upper right sternal border here is systolic ejection murmurs, especially aortic stenosis and hokum. And the left axilla, you listen for radiation of the PSM of mitral regurgitation. And just below the left clavicle is where you want to hear the continuous machin machinery murmur of a persistent PDA. This is how we grade intensity of murmurs, guys, graded 1 to 6. So 1 is heard only by an expert in optimum conditions. We're not talking about auditory hallucinations. <laughs> grade 2 is heard by a non-expert in optimum conditions. 3 is easily heard, but there's no accompanying thrill. 4 is a loud murmur with a thrill. Must be a thriller. Grade 5 is very loud, often heard over a wide area with a thrill. And 6 is extremely loud, even heard without a set scope. By definition, diastolic murmurs are graded either 1 to 6. Diastolic murmurs either 1 to 4. Okay. Any added sounds? Then we have pericardial rub or opening snap. You want to listen to the back. I had for crepitation, speaking to pulmonary edema. Palpate that liver for that nice tender liver. Very tender. In congestive heart failure or the parasitic liver and tricuspid regurgitation. Palpate that spleen because you get splenomegaly in bacterial endocarditis. What are abnormalities of intensity of the first heart sound? So you get a soft heart sound if there's low cardiac output, a long PR interval as in first degree heart block. Poor LV function with a low EF and dramatic mitral regurgitation. A loud S1 and increased cardiac output, large stroke volume, mitral stenosis. So short period interval atrial myxoma variable in atrial fibrillation where there's not proper priming of the left ventricle because you don't have coordinated contraction of the left atrium right complete heart block and extra systoles here I'm speaking to splitting of the second heart sound so we know under normal physiological circumstances on inspiration there is going to be the pulmonary valve closing after the aortic valve so we have uh, physiological splitting but if there's an atrial septal defect, we have a collaboration of pressure between the left and right ventricles and there will be no splitting on inspiration. Reverse splitting happens when there's some impotence to left ventricular outflow and the aortic valve actually closes after the pulmonary valve. 
and imagine the second half sound, it's soft in low cardiac output, calcium figuric snorsus aortic regurgitation, it's loud with systemic hypertension or pulmonary hypertension, speaking to aortic and pulmonary components specifically, and the, the split wires and inspiration, we, we already covered splitting in our previous slide. Guys, remember the following points. If you hear a mid-diastolic murmur in the middle area, make sure you have listened with the bell of this death by turning the patient to the left natural position with a breath hole after expiration, otherwise you're going to miss that low-pitched mid-diastolic murmur of mitral stenosis. If there's an early diastolic murmur present, make sure you listen with the patient sitting and bending forward, breath hole after expiration, otherwise you're going to miss aortic regurgitation. If there's a pan-systolic murmur you detect in the middle area or at the apex, make sure that you listen up high in the left axilla for radiation, otherwise you're going to miss mitral regurgitation. If there's an uh, ejection systolic murmur present in the aortic area, make sure you listen uh, to the carotids for radiation, otherwise you miss aortic stenosis. Just a quick note about the uh, pericardial rub. It's a superficial, harsh, scratchy, creaking, grating, leathery <laughs> sound present both in Sicily and diastole. Louder with the patient sitting and bending forward and breathing out. It's augmented by pressing the stealth lightly or against the patient's chest and also with breath holding. It's heard best over the bare area of the heart, that is the part not covered by the lung, which is in the left lower sternum. Presence of pericardial rub indicates pericarditis in our setting, TB, 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 and more TB, but uremia, viral infection, and acute MI are also common culprits. Guys, this is a phonocardiogram illustrating mitral regurgitation. So you're listening at the apex, you determine if the patient has apical pan-systolic murmur radiating high into the left axilla. Uh, in mitral valve prolapse, you're going to have a mid-systolic click together with that, right? In the aortic stenosis, listen in the aortic area, you find an ejection systolic murmur which radiates up into the neck, so you want to determine that. This is a phonocardiogram of aortic regurgitation. Here we're looking at the parasternal area and the fifth interspace, and it gives you an early diastolic murmur, but it also can give you a mid systolic murmur because of increased runoff. Right, and here we have mitral stenosis listening in the mitral area. Remember, it gives you a loud first heart sound together with an opening snap and a mid diastolic murmur together with pre systolic accentuation of the murmur if the patient's in sinus rhythm. Beloved, I just want to encourage you about self control. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs, chapter 25, verse 28, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. Oh dear. The book of Galatians, chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, tells us, if the fruit of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So I pray that we will ask the Holy Spirit to grant us self-control in every area of our life, specifically in our inner thought life, that part of your life that nobody else can see besides yourself and God. Also self-control in our conversation, in our reactions, in our emotions, in our relationships, in our careers, in our finances, in every aspect. God bless you. I'll see you soon with another video, part two in cardiovascular examination.